Good afternoon <laughs> and welcome to the Johns Hopkins 30 minute COVID-19 briefing where we provide live insights from the experts who lead our work at the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. For the next half hour, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic and public health responses. As part of this briefing, we'll have an opportunity for live Q&A with our experts. We'll be offering these 30 minute briefings regularly on Fridays at 12 p.m. I'm Dr. Lainey Rutko, a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I'm part of the leadership team for the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. We'll be providing answers in real time today, so please submit your questions in the box at the bottom of your screen. As always, there's much for us to discuss. I'm joined by two guests. First, Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo is a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Jennifer will give us an update about the public health implications of the COVID-19 data. Next, Dr. Bill Moss is executive director of the Johns Hopkins International Vaccine Access Center and a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Bill will give an update about COVID-19 vaccines. I'll now turn to each of our speakers for a brief overview. Jennifer, there have been many developments since our last briefing, including that the US has now surpassed 25 million cases of COVID and the world has surpassed 100 million cases. What trends are you most concerned about right now? Thanks so much, Lainey. Well, there's sort of a good news, bad news situation this week. Obviously, the fact that we have reached um, and exceeded now 100 million cases worldwide is clearly a troubling development, as is um, the uh, milestone of reaching the milestone of 25 million cases in the United States. But um, starting with a little bit of good news, um, we are now finally starting to see case numbers uh, decline in the U.S., um, so in this past week, there are about 1.1 million cases reported in the United States, and that's clearly a lot of cases and, and not good. But uh, two weeks ago, we were seeing 1.68 million. So really a, quite a, a fairly substantial difference. Um, for the first time in a month, no states have reported record uh, high case counts in the past week. So that is uh, quite uh, good news as well. Um, case numbers are declining in nearly every state. Um, and these, uh, this is now a trend because we've been seeing this for a, a couple of weeks. So um, that, that is, I think, a, a good news. And it's, I think, important to point out some um, cautious good news when we see it. Um, but there still are things to worry about with respect to the United States. One is that um, while case numbers appear to be slowing, deaths remain um, at a record high. And uh, we uh, are now more than 430,000 deaths reported in the United States. Um, that said, um, I, you know, this is not entirely surprising that our death numbers would be still high when our case numbers are coming down because deaths tend to lag cases. So if these case trends um, hold and we continue to see declines, I am hopeful that in the coming weeks we will start to see a, a downturn in deaths. Um, similarly, hospitalizations appear, appear to be leveling off in the United States, um, so that's good news. Um, that said, there is now still some things to worry about, of course. One is that our test positivity in the United States um, remains too high. Um, we are uh, just under 9%, 8.54% nationally. Um, and that's uh, well beyond, um, you know, kind of the maximum uh, benchmark that the WHO has recommended. And when the, the number is high, um, what that suggests is that we may be um, continuing to miss infections and, and not counting them as cases. The test positivity trend has is, is been ticking down, so that is good news, but um, we absolutely must continue to keep our eye on testing and continue to expand testing to make sure we're casting a wide enough net to find infections. And there have now been several reports that states have, uh, in fact, sort of shifted their focus away from testing because they're focused on the equally important goal of rolling out vaccines, but we can't do one without the other. We very much need to continue to focus on testing to make sure that we are not having blind spots in our surveillance for COVID-19. Um, globally, uh, though the numbers are starting to tick down um, across the globe, there are still um, spots of the world that um, remain quite worrisome. In particular, the, the resurgence of cases on the continent of Africa is a particularly worrisome development and governments there are um, beginning to respond. 
We, of course, are tracking globally the uh, emergence and detection of um, genetic variants of the virus, and in particular, um, ones that are suggesting they may be um, more easily transmitted between people. That gives us um, a lot of worry, um, in part because it, while it doesn't change the efforts that we have uh, need to do in order to control the spread of the virus, it very much adds urgency to it. There, of course, is also concern that these um, variants um, may uh, continue and um, you know, outpace our efforts to administer vaccine. There have been questions about the um, whether we will one day see a variant that could um, not respond to our vaccines and therapeutics in the way that we wish. Uh, so really what this means is as long as this virus is continuing to circulate, there are more opportunities um, for mutations to occur. And it really then, I think, becomes a race against time to make sure we try to control this virus as quickly as possible through all of our tools that we've been using, vaccine, public health measures, testing, isolation, quarantine, contact tracing. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Before I turn to Bill, I want to remind our audience to please submit questions for our experts in the box at the bottom of your screen. After we hear from Bill, we'll move to our Q&A um, portion of the briefing. Bill. We're seeing now an increasing disparity between demand for COVID vaccines and available vaccine supply. Can you talk us through the latest developments? Yes, thank you, Lainey. And it's been another really busy week in the COVID-19 uh, vaccine world. Um, the big news today is the, the, re the press release of the preliminary results from the Johnson & Johnson phase three trial. I'll, I'll come to that, but my, my favorite story of the week uh, related to uh, doses and distribution actually was the one that some of our viewers may have heard about, the public health workers in Josephine County, Oregon, who were administering a vaccine in a, in a rural part of Oregon. Um, when a snowstorm came, uh, they closed the site down early and were driving back to their, their health center when a tractor trailer jackknifed on the road and they got stuck along with uh, a line of traffic uh, in a snowstorm. They had one vial of Moderna vaccine uh, left with six doses, and they viewed that as such a precious commodity that they got out and started knocking on doors of people uh, stuck in their cars uh, in front and behind them to see if anyone wanted a vaccine. And not everyone accepted the vaccine in this very unusual circumstance, uh, but they were able to identify six people and administered six doses. So I think, Lainey, that just highlights, uh, you know, how precious uh, vaccine doses are in the United States and uh, and the demand side, uh, you know, people willing to get a vaccine in very un unusual circumstances. Um, we've had more than 48 million doses of, of COVID-19 vaccines administered in the United States, uh, over 26 million doses administered. We're up to about 54% on that. Uh, so we've seen that percentage going up, a lot of state to state variability. Uh, over 4 million people have received two doses of the vaccine. Um, we are getting our daily uh, daily totals up of people vac uh, vaccinated up to around 1.5 million, so higher than uh, than the Biden administration's goal of a, a 1 million dose per day for 100 days uh, right now. We'll have to see if that can be sustained. About 6.5 percent of the U.S. population has received one dose, and 1.3 dose uh, percent have received two uh, two doses. Now this compares. Some other countries are doing really well on this. For for various reasons, Israel, for example, has vaccinated almost half of their population. What we've heard this week uh, from the Biden administration are plans to increase the number of doses by 16 percent, uh, going to the states and providing the states, and I think this is really important, uh, with several weeks notice so that they can really plan on how they're going to get these vaccines delivered. Uh, the other big news uh, on the dose side this week in the United States was the plans to purchase an additional 100 million doses each of the Pfizer and Moderna messenger RNA vaccines. And we're, we're seeing increasingly uh, these large vaccination sites outside of healthcare centers, outside of pharmacies uh, that are really needed for the mass vaccination uh, campaigns. What I want to touch on now, Lainey and, and Jennifer alluded to the these new variants is, is the particularly concerning uh, 
data that we're seeing now uh, that that of lower vaccine efficacy uh, against uh, particularly the South African variant. So there are a number of variants uh, that have been named and described, the one from Britain, South Africa, Brazil, uh, more recently California. Uh, I have no doubt that we have our own uh, uh, U.S. variants given the amount of virus transmission that's gone on uh, over the past year in, in the United States. Uh, we heard initial reports about laboratory studies of the Materna, Moderna and Pfizer vaccine suggesting that uh, that these vaccines would be protective against these new variants, perhaps some lowered uh, neutralization uh, of the South African variant, but it looked like the neutralizing antibodies might be sufficient uh, to provide protection. But these were all uh, in vitro or laboratory studies. Um, and what we've seen this past week are, are with two uh, yet to be approved or, or even authorized vaccines in the United States, but where we're seeing worrisome evidence that, uh, that our current uh, uh, portfolio of vaccines may have reduced uh, efficacy against these variants. First was the Novavax vaccine. This is a protein-based vaccine, so quite different than the messenger RNA vaccines, um, but uh, they reported 90% uh, uh, efficacy uh, among about 15,000 individuals in Britain. But uh, con uh, disturbingly, the, uh, the vaccine efficacy was only about 50% uh, in South Africa, where that South African variant is spreading widely. Um, it, if they excluded HIV infected individuals, that vaccine efficacy was about 60%. But uh, more than 90% of the people who got uh, who were vaccinated and got infected in that trial had the uh, this new uh, South African variant. So that's quite concerning. And then just today, just earlier today, as I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Johnson and Johnson released a press release, um, preliminary findings from their phase three trial. So we don't have all the data yet. Now, this is an adenovirus vectored vaccine with a human adenovirus, adenovirus 26. Again, a, a, a different type of vaccine delivery platform. But what uh, people have been hopeful about this vaccine is that it could be single dose um, and really only requires refrigeration uh, rather than the, the freezers and even ultra cold freezers of the messenger RNA vaccines. So overall, uh, in these pre preliminary results from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, 66% uh, effective in preventing moderate to severe disease 28 days after vaccination. 85% effective in preventing severe disease. These are really important findings. Again, a single dose, um, complete protection against uh, COVID-related hospitalization and death. Uh, so uh, really quite uh, remarkable uh, protection. And that protection, again, we don't have all the details, seem to be consistent across different age groups, including uh, adults over the age of 60 years um, and across different racial and ethnic groups. What was concerning, Lainey, is that the uh, the efficacy was 72% in the United States, but only 57% in South Africa, which was one of their uh, their sites uh, uh, for the trial. And so again, concern that the South African variant may result in lower efficacy from our, our current vaccines. Um, this, uh, again, to highlight what Jennifer said, makes it really important that uh, we get control of this virus, uh, prevent transmission through our public health measures measures and vaccines as soon as possible because these viruses, this virus will continue to mutate. And, and lastly, uh, all of the vaccine manufacturers uh, that we talked about are really working on modifying their vaccine uh, to include uh, the, the South African variant. Um, but that's going to take some time uh, to modify the vaccine, go through some small bridging uh, trials and get regulatory approval. Thanks so much, Bill. I see lots of questions um, coming in for both you and Jennifer. So I'm gonna turn now to, to Q&A and Bill, first question is for you. What do we know about um, individuals who have antibodies, um, you know, either because they had a, a case of COVID-19 or perhaps they, they had an asymptomatic case. What do we know about those individuals when they get vaccinated. Um, and the question is specifically, will those folks potentially experience a more serious reaction or different types of adverse events? 
Yes, this is an, it's an important question. And, um, you know, right now they, uh, people who had prior COVID, as we've talked about before, you know, uh, aren't excluded from being vaccinated. Uh, we, the recommendations are that those people get vaccinated. There were a small number, a small proportion of individuals in the, in the phase three trials uh, that we've seen for Moderna and Pfizer who had uh, pre-existing antibodies to SARS coronavirus 2 um, at time of enrollment in the trial and who were vaccinated. The numbers are small, so we we, we can't draw a lot of inferences, um, but it, uh, they, they did notice that people with prior history of, uh, of COVID-19 and with these antibodies did get reinfected, some did. Um, and so there's potential benefit in, uh, to being vaccinated and hence those recommendations. Um, there was no evidence against the number were, were small that they were at higher risk of, uh, of any adverse event. Um, and biologically, I would not expect them uh, to be at higher risk of adverse events. What we might expect are those pre existing antibodies could potentially diminish the efficacy of the vaccine. We see that more though with live attenuated vaccines, which these are not. Um, and so um, I, I, don't ex uh, I, I don't expect problems. We're learning more about that, but there was some data that came out of the phase three trials. Thanks, Bill. Jennifer, a question for you. How do we identify these new variants that we're hearing so much about? And how do we distinguish between the ones that are developing in the US versus ones that, for example, are now um, called the South Africa variant or the UK variant? Sure, well, the, the general answer is that we um, conduct sequencing um, to find uh, the mutations. And um, it's a little bit uh, concerning that we identify the variants um, by the geographic origin. It's basically the, the place where they were first detected, um, but it's not necessarily the place where they uh, originated. Um, unfortunately, the, the scientific names for these variants are cumbersome and a you know, series of letters and, and numbers, so I understand why people use the, the place shorthand. Um, but essentially, we, we do the sequencing. The challenge is that um, globally, uh, sequencing is really deficient, and some countries do a whole lot more than others. So for instance, the UK and South Africa um, do um, much more sequencing than many other countries, and so it's somewhat not surprising that they were first to find uh, the variants. Now, it, it could very well be that those variants originated there, but I don't think we have a complete picture. Similarly, as we are finding variants, say, here in the United States, I think we have to recognize the fact that we are um, starting to increase sequencing. And until very recently, the United States did a very small amount of sequences. For the number of cases that we have had to date, um, we are still doing a very small amount of sequencing. You know, we have 25 million cases and tens of thousands of sequences done. So really a, a big disconnect there. So I think it's important to interpret with caution when we hear um, increasing numbers of, of variants found that that is partially a function of our now starting to ramp up um, surveillance. But obviously the finding of these variants, even if, you know, it's incomplete and we don't know where they are and where they aren't, finding them, of course, um, adds urgency to our efforts. Thanks, Jennifer. Another question for you. What advice um, do you have for those who have recovered from, um, from a COVID infection, especially in light of the new variants? So are they now newly vulnerable? How should they be thinking? Well, you know, I think as Bill pointed out, um, there has been evidence of people being reinfected even um, absent the variants. So I think uh, the, um, the advice at this point to everybody, whether you've had it, whether you haven't, whether you've been vaccinated or not, is to um, still continue to protect yourself. Thanks, Jennifer. And Bill, as, as a follow-up to that for, for you, um, we're getting several questions about um, the situation in Brazil and the, the potential for, for reinfection. Um, can, can you speak to, to what we know about that? Yeah, so, um, you know, we, as, as Jennifer said, uh, you know, we, we have seen evidence of, of reinfection following natural infection. Um, and we're we obviously in the in the trials. Uh, people are getting infected at at low rates, but uh, people who've been vaccinated. And so, you know, the bottom line is, I think we still have a lot to learn about uh, the 
you know, protection after both natural infection and with the, uh, our current vaccines uh, against new variants. Um, but again, uh, just to emphasize, this is really a critical time that we uh, do everything we can to decrease transmission um, because we'll continue to, uh, variants will continue to emerge as long as this virus is spreading as widely as it is. Thanks, Bill. Another question, and, and this is one that, um, that that comes up quite a bit, is where we are in terms of the vaccine and pregnant women. Yeah. And could could you sort of summarize the the current state of the science, please? Yes, this is a and it's a particularly hot issue right now because of very recent uh, WHO statements uh, regarding vaccination of of pregnant women. Um, the bottom line, just to kind of summarize, is that um, we don't have good data on uh, COVID-19 vaccination with, I'll say that, you know, the Pfizer Moderna vaccines because pregnant women were excluded uh, deliberately from the phase two trial. And that's often how it's done. Um, we, we look at vaccine efficacy in um, non-pregnant adults before uh, evaluating that in pregnant women, but it definitely puts pregnant women in this difficult position. We do know that COVID-19 can be more severe uh, in pregnant women, so there's real urgency in protecting pregnant women. Um, we are learning more about safety and efficacy of these vaccines in pregnant women as the vaccines are rolled out and some women became pregnant in the phase three trials. Um, my understanding is that Pfizer has plans to actually begin studies, formal studies of, uh, of their vaccine in pregnant women. Um, but right now it really comes down to a, a, a risk benefit assessment by the, the woman uh, herself in conjunction with her family and health care provider and really weighing whether there are other ways um, like masking and social distancing, uh, she can mitigate the risk of COVID-19 um, and whether she's willing to take, you know, uh, an unknown um, uh, risk of, of the vaccine. Again, there's no, there are no biological reasons why we think uh, the mRNA vaccines would be uh, particularly harmful to the pregnant woman or, or her fetus, but it's just an unknown at this point. Thanks, Bill. Another question for you about what what do we know in terms of vaccines and their ability to impact what what folks are now calling um, the COVID long hauler phenomenon um, and and if possible, can you include what we know about uh, the J and J vaccine in that? Yeah, I mean this is a tough question because we don't really know yet, uh, you know, what the the outcomes, long term outcomes are are of people who were vaccinated, you know, got two doses and then had kind of a breakthrough infection. Um, I, I would say overall that the risk of having a low low haul, uh, long haul uh, COVID, you know, signs or symptoms is reduced after vaccination simply because you have uh, a reduced risk of having mild, moderate or severe disease. Um, so uh, the bottom line is, uh, if, if that's a concern, to get vaccinated, prevent mild, moderate, severe uh, COVID-19, and that way prevent uh, the long-term uh, sequelae. Thanks, Bill. No surprise, many vaccine questions today, so I'm going to stay with you. What, what are your thoughts about the COVID vaccine eventually becoming something like the flu vaccine where there's um, the expectation of, of an annual vaccination? Yes, this, this too is a, it's a very important question. Um, again, still, still unknown. Um, I, my own, I'll just speculate, um, you know, we certainly first have to reduce transmission uh, massively in order to uh, mitigate the evolution and mutation of these vaccines. Um, but once we do that, um, I don't anticipate that uh, we're going to have to give uh, these vaccines uh, annually like we do with a, in, for influenza. Influenza virus, very different virus, um, has much greater ability at really changing itself uh, substantially that the, that the coronaviruses do not have. Now, whether it, it is possible that down the line people might need a booster, uh, a booster dose, and maybe that's a booster dose with uh, that's been modified for a different variant. That's very likely, but I do not foresee that we're going to need annual uh, vaccination against SARS coronavirus two. 
Thanks, Bill. So we've we've spoken about pregnant women, another population that um, there's real concern about are young children, especially those aged one to, to 10 or 11. When do you do you anticipate, if at all, that there'll be a vaccine product for that age group? Oh, there will be a, a vaccine product for those age group. And again, you know, this is a very typical process where we start uh, vaccine trials are started in, in adults and then uh, move to special populations such as pregnant women and then move the age group down. Um, there are already trials ongoing uh, and uh, go down to 12 years of age uh, with the with the uh, the mRNA vaccine. So I expect we're going to see results of that soon. Those are much smaller trials. Those are just, you know, several thousand uh, children rather than tens of thousands of adults in that first phase three uh, trial. Um, and then, you know, those will be evaluated and then we'll go down to probably a six month uh, to 11 year range. And, and some of those trials are already in planning mm -hmm. stages. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, in the coming months, we'll certainly learn, we'll see results on the 12 to 16 year old age Age group, and then uh, perhaps a couple months after that in the youngest age group. Thanks so much. We are coming up quickly on 1230, so I'm going to wrap up. I'd like to thank Jennifer Nuzzo and Bill Moss for joining me today, and also give a big thank you to everyone who joined us, and especially to those who submitted questions for our experts to answer. This briefing will be archived and available on coronavirus.jhu.edu. As a reminder, we will offer these 30 minute briefings regularly on Fridays at 12 p.m. And in each briefing, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic. And we will have live Q&A with our experts. I'll look forward to seeing you at our next 30 minute briefing. Until then, thanks and stay safe. <laughs>